Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Objects That Changed the World lecture series organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Miami University Alumni Association, today we present Concrete with Steve Tuck. Steve Tuck is professor of classics and has published widely on Roman art and archeology. span Professor Tuck has conducted archaeological fieldwork and research in Italy, Greece, England, and Egypt. He has directed more than a dozen study tours in Italy, concentrated in the city of Rome and in the area around the Bay of Naples, including Pompeii, Herculaneum, and the island of Capri. He has given more than 50 public lectures, including as the National Lecturer for the Archaeological Institute of America. An esteemed teacher, Professor Tuck received the 2013 E. Phillips Knox Teaching Award, Miami University's highest honor for innovative and effective undergraduate teaching. Welcome to Dr. Tuck, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Questions were collected during registration, and Dr. Tuck will attempt to address some of those throughout the webinar today. You'll also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. Please note that in the interest of time we have available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for those questions and answers. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Tuck. Welcome. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. And, um, and don't worry, you won't have to look at me the whole time. I am going to go ahead and um, move immediately to, um, to my presentation so you can um, take a look at that instead of me. And that'll be a treat for everybody, I promise. Um, more of a treat. Let's go with that. How about that? Um, let's um, see if we can take a look at that. All right. So um, this, of course, is entitled concrete, but it's really Roman concrete. That's what I care about. And, um, and hey, it's my talk. Um, but before we get started, um, I think it's uh, only appropriate that we, um, we mention those who are, who are responsible for uh, sponsoring this. My talk today is part of the Objects That Change the World lecture series, which is organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Alumni Association. This online lecture series invites us to contemplate objects that fundamentally reshaped human experience, from concrete and porcelain to the birth control pill and the first blues recording. Each talk explores the history and cultural legacy of a transformative human creation. Sponsored by the Friends of the Humanities, Objects That Change the World celebrates the central role of the humanities in a Miami education and in modern society. If you'd like to become a friend of the humanities, please consider a donation to the center in any amount. Annual gifts from Friends of the Humanities are indispensable to funding the Humanities Center's workshops, fellowships, student programs, and alumni outreach efforts. Fulfilling the center's commitment to students, faculty, and the public would not be possible without your help please join the generous alumni and friends who have invested in the future of the humanities. Every dollar makes a difference. To learn more about the important work of the Humanities Center at Miami, you can go to, and the, the address is on your screen, humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. And to donate or to become a friend of the Humanities Center, you can go to give to miamioh.org slash Humanity Center. Thank you very much. Well, that has been our underwriting. Let's turn our attention now to Roman concrete. And I'm testing your um, your patience immediately with a-, a Steve, sorry to jump in. Uh, one thing real quick. Can you just hide your message notification from oh, StreamYard at the bottom so much. that it doesn't cover anything up? There we thank go. You. Yes, I got so excited, I forgot to do that. All right. Um, I just wanted to um, to briefly say um, what are some of the key things about Roman concrete that make it such an incredible creation. Um, the development of Roman concrete, um, coupled with um, the inspiration from Greek architecture, allowed the Romans to create um, works of a scale that they had not 
previously dreamt of. Not only that, it allowed the Romans to create infrastructure and to create what we refer to as the architectural revolution, a true revolution in the history of architecture, which changed the forms of architecture in the ancient world and through their influence right up into today. And so the fact of the use of concrete really has altered, um, I think, um, the, the history of architecture from the ancient world right up to, well, I'm going to go with last Monday. Um, we're going to start with a key date, though, because um, I love dates. And that is the Romans founded a colony at the site of Puteoli in 194 BC. Now, Puteoli, if you're not familiar with it, and nobody is, um, is right here on the north side of the Bay of Naples, north of Naples itself, in another secondary bay. The important thing about Puteoli is it was the largest natural harbor in the entire uh, Italian peninsula. All of the main um, uh, goods and, and uh, people traveled through there. It was the main uh, um, cargo as well as personnel harbor in ancient Italy. It was the second largest city after Rome in ancient Italy. And it's a heavily volcanic area, which is the point of this somewhat confusing map on the upper right. It shows you in the green here um, the volcanic area around um, Puteoli or in modern day Pozzo Pozzuoli. The fact of that volcanic area is critical because Roman control of this territory put them into direct um, contact with and control of the resources of Pozzolana or what the Roman architect Vitruvius called Pulvis Puteolanus. And that is this volcanic sand, as, as um, he called it, Vitruvius called it, that makes Roman concrete. And so the Romans had the raw materials in their control starting in 194 BC. Those raw materials combined with inspiration from Greek architecture allowed the Romans to start with a large scale um, application of concrete architecture. So we need to look at just one example of Greek architecture. And I have selected, well, we only have time for the best. I've selected the best. And that is the Sanctuary of Asclepius on the island of Kos in the Eastern Mediterranean. It is a large multi-level terraced sanctuary built by the Greeks in the second century BC. And it looks like yeah, it looks like a Greek sanctuary. Looks like a Roman sanctuary. Except when you get up close, you'll see that the architecture here is made of squared blocks, ashlar masonry. There's no concrete here. This is Greek architecture, and it's made of squared blocks of cut stone. Mortar, but no concrete. The front of the terrace walls, particularly along here, is articulated by a line of barrel vaults that support the edge of that um, terrace platform above. Really nice. This was what inspired the Romans to create their own sets of these large scaled terraced multi-level sanctuaries, only using concrete, which allowed them to do so. We're gonna just take a look at a couple of these because this is the first large scale use of concrete in the Roman world, it was inspired directly by that Greek architecture, but to create these vast forms. One of the earliest of these, about, about 100 BC, is the sanctuary of Fortuna Primagenia at Praeneste. Here's Praeneste on the map, uh, just slightly um, east of Rome here in the area of Latium. And there's the plan of this incredible sanctuary, it rises up a hill, several hundred feet um, in a series of terraces up the hillside in Praeneste. You'll see, I think, um, that the front of this looks very much like that sanctuary of Asclepius at Kos, except when you look at the front here in the photo on the right, you'll see that it's not ashlar masonry. It's actually concrete um, terracing with the front of these barrel vaults, but it's all done um, with concrete that's covered with a stone facing. And so the material 
is what allowed the Romans to build these enormous um, structures, unlike anything that had happened before. When we look at a detail of this, I think you can get a sense of what they're doing here. Um, it's really quite extraordinary. They're articulating that facade with a series of um, of um, semicircular apses or niches, if you will. Um, and if you look closely, the uh, the roofing in here is a long barrel vault, a long continuous vault. Think about a, a Roman arch in three dimensions, an arch that goes on. Only this one is a curved vault, and they've added coffering on the inside of this. The coffering is a is a Greek architectural feature. Um, it reduces the weight of the vaulting. Not necessarily um, critical in concrete construction, but what the Romans have done here is they have imitated um, the, um, the Greek architectural features by adding that coffering on the interior. And so what we see here is this tremendous sanctuary that is made only possible because of Roman application of concrete. There's several of these, but I just want to show you three of them just so you can get a sense that that, that one that we just looked at at Prineste is not the only one. There's another one um, at Tivoli, also east of Rome here, and another one at Terracina. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a very good map um, with both of these clearly marked, but there's Terracina down on the coast of Latium, and there's Tivoli. So what we're seeing is that the Romans are going outside the city of Rome and experimenting with this large-scale architecture in these sanctuaries. And here's two really good reconstructions of the sanctuary of Feronia at Terracina. It's a large terraced sanctuary on the top of a mountain. There's actually a cliff right, uh, right below here. Step over there and you'll fall about 150 feet. Um, take my word for it, it's not as much fun as you think. I've gone down there. Um, and here at Tivoli, um, a great temple and well, a full sanctuary of Hercules Victor. Now, here's the thing. These are about 50 years apart. Um, and I know that there's there's no um, there's no scale on here, so let me just tell you. Um, across the front of this um, terrace platform at Terracina is just over 200 feet. We've got that line of barrel vaults that supports and articulates the front. Again, um, an inheritance from the Greeks. So just over 200 feet across, good size. But 50 years later, we go to Tivoli and the Temple of Hercules Victor, and the frontage across here is over 200 yards. This platform is 150 yards deep and 200 yards wide. Not only that, you can see it's not just a platform with maybe a, a line of barrel vaults. What they've done is built around it four stories tall, three fully articulated stories and an attic story here. Um, this is all concrete construction, making up the platform, subterranean tunnels underneath so you can access these rooms around that frame that temple. All of this is made possible, and of course, <laughs> the theater, because of concrete construction. And this one um, at at Tivoli, I don't know if you can see very well, these are people on the road leading in. These little dots here are all individuals. Um, even the doorway here is over 20 feet tall. It's enormous. The scale is vast. So the Romans are clearly using concrete to do something that they had wanted to do, um, inspired by the Greeks, but now they're playing with scale and creating material that is just much larger than ever seen before. Here's the platform, the subterranean parts of the platform at Terracina, those great barrel vaults that go across and the doorways that connect them with a cryptoporticus hallway. You can see they've added here, in addition to that, um, that irregular facing, they've added squared uh, coins, uh, uh, ashlared blocks making up the corners. And this is all again facing on the concrete. At Tivoli, this is the top of the platform, and this is part of that um, 
of that um, surround that frames the temple. This was in such great condition that you can see the glass and um, and steel construction on top. This was they had just roofed over the entire top of the platform and used this as an industrial facility throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, this thing was so massive and so well built. Um, it's still being used um, today. It's really pretty pretty extraordinary. So in the early phase of concrete construction in the Roman world, what we see is them um, using the material to create things that are inspired by, well, what they had wanted to do to, to imitate the Greeks. In the second phase of concrete construction, what we see really is the exploration of concrete used to create infrastructure. And this is the sort of thing that takes the Romans out of just being inspired by the Greeks and really creating something um, completely new. And I've just selected one example out of the 14 I originally had in this lecture. Um, I had a lot of these, but we were gonna end up like the Donner party, it was gonna be ugly. So, so I cut it back and we just wanna look at one Roman harbor. And this is the harbor at Caesarea Maritima. Now Caesarea Maritima is a city on um, the west coast of, um, of Israel today. You can see an aerial view of it here on the right. There's the, the remains of the harbor here. And then on the left, this wonderful painting, which I um, I ripped off from National Geographic about 25 years ago. Ah, it's a great painting of the harbor at Caesarea. Um, the important thing about the harbor at Caesarea in terms of what we care about, that is concrete, is that this was all done using concrete materials that came directly from Puteoli on the Bay of Naples. That is the raw materials were exported from Puteoli on ships and brought here directly. And what the Romans did was used concrete to enable them to create an enclosed harbor on a coast that was otherwise bare, that didn't have any protected anchorage like this. How they did that was pretty amazing. We have some descriptions, but really thanks to um, the modern excavations, we have an excellent notion of how, um, how this was achieved. And what the Romans did um, was that they created these wooden forms, wooden concrete forms, which is still what we use today to create concrete, create wooden forms, you pour in the, the liquid concrete and it sets up in whatever shape you want it to be in. In this case, they floated wooden forms out um, into place or into position above where they wanted them to be, filled them with the liquid concrete. And then once the concrete was in there, they sank um, and they sank in position. And then gradually um, they used these to build up the breakwaters to enclose that harbor. The extraordinary thing about Roman concrete is that it's hydraulic. That is, it sets up underwater, even under seawater. And so they just dropped these forms and all with the boxes into place um, and uh, eventually built these up enough to make, um, make a foundation layer. And then they would cover it um, eventually with squared stone to make the the top um, the top of the breakwater, it's really an extraordinary um, an extraordinary achievement, and technically, it's just superb. Um, excavations here at Caesarea have have discovered the remains of the of the wooden forms actually still there. Uh, they've done coring in the concrete, and this is uh, this is one of the concrete cores where you can see um, the the um, pozzolana ash and the aggregates, the lime. Um, and the, the pumice aggregate that they've used here, imported materials from Italy all the way here to the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the sort of thing that made the Roman world possible. Massive infrastructure projects like this, aqueducts, harbors, and so on, that enabled the Romans to essentially link their entire empire together. And it was concrete that did that. Well, that uh, I think really is sort of the second phase of, 
um, Roman concrete. When they moved away from the Greek influence and started doing something different, that is applying their, um, by that point, um, 100 years of knowledge of concrete um, into infrastructure. The third phase of Roman concrete architecture is the most important. And it's actually, I think, the most exciting. I, I have to say, I wrote my dissertation on Roman harbors, so I'm very excited by Roman harbors. I can talk about them literally all day. But it is the architectural revolution where we see concrete really changing the shape and form of, um, of architecture forever, not just allowing people to build things that they saw in another material, but really to, to alter the forms of architecture. To understand how revolutionary this revolution is, you kind of have to understand um, what had come before. Previously, before the architectural revolution, Greek and Roman architecture was largely um, post and lintel architecture. Whether it was done in timber or stone, it's largely rectangular forms, boxes, sometimes large boxes filled with smaller boxes, but boxes. And buildings were largely decorated on their exteriors, not on their interiors. So you have rectangular or square forms with um, decoration on the exteriors, um, and everything is very um, boxy. The architectural revolution turned that literally inside out. The use of concrete enabled the Romans to create um, curved forms, curvilinear spaces with new forms of roofing, vaults, domes, half domes, segmented domes, all sorts of experimental types of roofing um, that you can do with concrete. Any Thing that you can make a wooden form of and pour the concrete into, you can make that shape. And so for the first time, the Romans were able to explore um, really um, extraordinary curvilinear shapes made possible by concrete. This created architecture of a different scale. Rather than just using vast amounts of concrete to raise up their temples, they're using vast amounts of concrete to create space to surround space so that um, they now focus on the interior rather than the exterior. They have tremendous amounts of light suddenly inside these, um, these buildings. They have water, they have light, um, and they have color. It's really an extraordinary change. And um, rather than, say, at those, um, at those large scale sanctuaries where you've got a temple and you walk up the central axis and it's all bilaterally symmetrical and all, no. Suddenly, what the Romans have done is, um, is, thanks to concrete, they create forms of architecture that are based on suites of rooms that um, allow them to explore curvilinear spaces rather than a large scale um, axial construction. I'll show you what I mean here in some examples, but it is truly revolutionary. One of the earliest examples of this is in the golden house of the emperor Nero. Um, now, Nero gets a bad rap, some of it deserved, some of it, I think, undeserved, but you can't fault Nero for his vision, I got to say. The man had vision, and he created a, a palace in the center of Rome. Um, the architects are some of the few we know their names of, Severus and Keller, and they created what was called the Golden House, and that's what we see here in this plan. It's a vast complex all made possible because of concrete. If you look at the plan for the Golden House, just one wing of the Golden House we're gonna look at here. What you see is, uh, and that's the dark part here, not this grayed out portion, that's later over building. It's this dark portion here, a series of suites of rooms that are organized centrally around open spaces, or in um, alternating shapes. So there's no centrality, there's no axiality. Instead, um, they're just creating these shapes of, um, of rooms and, um, and exploring. They're playing with the material um, for the first time. And so for example, number 75 here, 
um, comes off and makes a central apse on this suite of rooms. Number 65 is a barrel vaulted room with an apse in the back, flanked by two other rooms there. 60 similarly, and so on. They're just playing with um, shapes of rooms. And here, um, they've taken what would be the axiality of a central, um, um, say, a, a sanctuary, and and put it on a smaller scale and created these um, these really interesting little um, spaces. I said little. I shouldn't have said little. That was wrong. They're vast in scale. This is the inside of the Domus Aria. Um, and uh, you can see that the ceilings here are just over 60 feet tall. And again, it's all, you can see where the, the plasters come away and the, the, the brick facing. You can see the concrete uh, pier that makes up the edge here. And this is all one long barrel vaulted hallway with windows all the way down. This is underground and the light is still better here than it was in the previous sort of rectilinear post and lintel construction um, of the, of the Greco-Roman world. It's really extraordinary. The centerpiece, um, architecturally speaking, of this suite of rooms, or this wing of the palace, is this one. It's a really interesting um, room that, if you look at it, you see it has no walls. Instead, it has piers irregular piers here that support a segmented dome with a large oculus or an eye in the center of it. So the light comes in from there and then light comes in from light wells that are built into the sides so that all the rooms around this have raking light. These two have barrel vaulted ceilings or roofing. These groin or cross vaulted here and here. There's another barrel vaulted chamber there. So they're playing with this, alternating the types of roofing that they have, all made possible because of the concrete construction. You don't need as heavy walls to support the structure. You have these irregular piers instead. So you have far more open space than you do closed space, alternating open and closed, alternating um, roofing systems, Somebody is playing around here. And light, lots of light. That oculus there, which you see in the photograph of what it looks like today, and a reconstruction. Again, this thing is underground, and it's still filled with light, such that um, the Romans never had before. And the rooms leading off of it are not dark little cells, because they also have skylights. Um, and here you can see the brick-faced concrete piers that make up the supporting structure. And there's that segmented dome on the top of it, all of it resting on um, the lintels here. It's just brilliant. I decided just to focus on palaces because they give us a nice sense of, um, of um, development. Um, it's not just in palaces that we see the architectural revolution, but in all kinds of other buildings. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to just look at three palaces here, really, to give us a good sense of how they're playing with this material. So we have the palace of the Emperor Nero, done by Severus and Keller. Then we have the palace of the Emperor Domitian. The architect here, again, we know the name, Riberius. Um, and this is the palace that's built on the Palatine Hill in Rome, which is where our word palace comes from, from the Palatine Hill, that becomes the main residence of the Roman emperors for about the next 300 years because it's so well done. One of the things that makes this so extraordinary is the use of concrete to create huge, enormous closed spaces, which if they had done these large spaces with them, um, uh, with, um, you know, ashlar blocks, they would be cells, they would be tombs, they would just be enclosed. But because they're using concrete, it enables them to use these tremendous um, vaulting systems that open this up for light. This palace was, in fact, six stories tall, and it was all well lighted because of the alternation of open and closed spaces. You've got an open courtyard here on the left, you see, with a fountain in the center of it, closed rooms around it, like this one I'm indicating, and then behind that, 
another open courtyard with a fountain and then a closed room there. So you alternate these open and closed forms. And this is how the palace is arranged, not axially, but in suites of rooms around open courtyards. Here's the courtyard we were just looking at in the plan with closed spaces around it and open courts, um, smaller open courts around those. And similarly, another suite of rooms over here, a great courtyard in the center, and then concrete structures here, here, and here surrounding that. Um, and again, this all together is about six stories tall. The main block of the palace is, um, is here. You can see the large courtyard there. It's here on the left in the plan. Um, same orientation. There's the dining hall or the dining room there. Um, there is the, the great audience chamber, smaller audience rooms here and here. And again, um, large open spaces which are self-supporting because they use concrete. You don't need um, lines of columns in the center because you don't have wooden timbered roofing that needs to be supported across there. You've got a concrete dome. And so you can have this broad space over 50 feet wide um, made possible by the use of the concrete and um, tall. Uh, the ceilings in here are about 80 feet. There's that open courtyard there in the center, which allows light into all of these rooms. And then the dining room here again, um, with open um, courtyards on either side. to so again, allow light in because you don't have um, sidewalls. You have piers here. Again, the concrete um, barrel vaulted ceiling is supported just by piers. And you have somebody playing with curvilinear spaces. The Romans loved this idea of all um, alternation of um, semicircular, rectangular, semicircular. You see the same thing on this side: semicircular space here, rectangular there, semicircular here. Here is actually um, in design is sort of a, a rectangle with semicircular apses in the corners, and so they're playing with this alternation of space throughout. And this is another hallmark of, of concrete. If you can build the forms, you can make whatever shape you want. And I think you can see it better here um, in this um, suite of rooms in the palace. There's that um, first uh, courtyard we looked at down below, and there's rooms all around it. And again, you can see these alternating shapes here, here. Oh, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Sorry about that. Um, a barrel vaulted, uh, sorry, a groin or cross vaulted ceiling there, a segmented dome with an oculus, maybe a nod to um, Nero's palace there, um, and then smaller shapes. Um, a lot of use of the compass here throughout. Really, um, really um, sophisticated, interesting shapes made possible because everything is vaulted um, with concrete and the concrete is supportive enough to open this up in ways that they hadn't before. Well, we've looked at two palaces in the city of Rome, um, but really, um, I think greatest achievements in terms of the exploration of concrete as an experimental material are found at the villa of the Roman emperor Hadrian at Tivoli. You may remember Tivoli is the site of that great sanctuary of Hercules Victor that we looked at with the huge platform that was 200 yards across. Well, um, much later, about 118 AD, Hadrian, the emperor, goes out here about 20 miles outside the city of Rome and decides to build um, his villa. And this is essentially, it's a place for him to experiment with architecture. What he does is he comes out here to Tivoli and experiments with all sorts of forms. Segmented domes, large barrel vaults of the size that had never been, um, never been attempted before. Now these are experiments, they're not all successful. This dining space here, for example, has a half dome, but it wasn't originally a half dome. 
Um, it was actually three quarters of a dome. And you can see the remains of part of it down here. This half that's missing was supported by four columns across here on piers, and it sheared off. And that's actually a shear line there. Um, not enough support on this end. So we ended up with a half dome, a uh, half segmented dome, which is still there. The other half is, well, down here. Um, so he's experimenting about the limits of the material, what it takes to support it. Um, this is a segmented dome of a type that had never been attempted before. As far as we know, each of these segments also alternates that semicircular and rectangular shape that the Romans liked. That's a, a flat segment. That's a rounded segment there. You can see the, the, the profile, flat segment, rounded segment, so on. It's, again, playing with, um, with the material, playing with the limits of the architecture. Also, apparently, playing with a compass. Um, Hadrian, who I truly believe is the architect behind this, um, seems to have gotten a deal on compasses um, and is playing with circular forms. Not every room ends up being completely circular. For example, room 18 here seems to have been designed as a circular space. But then, as you can see on the left, they've cut off segments of that circle to create a different type of space. Again, a shape not seen before. We have half circles with a half dome roof, a full dome here, segmented domes, groin vaulted domes, all sorts of experimentation with vaulting systems, with shapes of rooms, and really uh, an extraordinary um, type of, um, of design here where you see that these rooms connect each other um, directly. There are no hallways or where they are, they're very small to connect these rooms. Each one is roofed independently and they're connected directly to one another. It is very complex. It's very sophisticated. And it's made possible because of concrete materials. Here's another example from the villa at Tivoli of this little entry foyer, where again, he's alternating those um, rectangular and semicircular forms and creating a segmented dome that comes down just on these piers on the corners there. Really extraordinary. Uh, testing the, I think, really the limits of the material. And again, getting his money worth, money's worth out of his compass. Um, here you can see his experimentation with central plan construction. This is an island surrounded by a little water canal, um, a water feature. And he's exploring, um, well, you can see it better in uh, on the right here, exploring these uh, round forms, circular, central, round forms throughout. And there you can see how those come out. Um, again, all supported by columns and small piers. There's very few um, solid walls in this um, in this roofed space. It's almost all individual piers. The central plan and creating a domed space that is supported only by piers seems to have been a real obsession of Hadrian's. And it led to what I will argue, in fact, I'll, I'll fight about, I would argue is the culmination of the Roman architectural revolution and um, only made possible because of concrete, the Pantheon. Now, the Pantheon is one of the best preserved Roman buildings we have, and it's still there in Rome. That image on the right there is one I took a few years ago myself, um, so I can testify to that. This is constructed in the 120s AD under Hadrian, I believe, with him as the architect. And what he's doing here is playing with this material, creating essentially a central plan round domed building, which he's then disguising with a traditional temple facade. So you have a traditional temple facade here. As you approach, it just looks like a regular temple. 
you pass through the porch, then you pass through this um, rectangular block that connects the porch and the um, rotunda into this amazing, unprecedented concrete space. That's it on the interior. Still intact. It's a large domed space. In modern terms, it's about 143 feet. It's 143 feet in diameter and 143 feet from um, roof to floor so that you could fit a sphere in there. And it is the largest unsupported concrete dome ever attempted by that point. And in fact, um, in world architecture uh, until the 1950s. Um, it's larger than the dome of St. Peter's. It's larger than any other dome up to, as I say, the 1950s when it was finally uh, surpassed. It's all made possible because of concrete. This is all concrete construction. And, and I particularly like um, these images of the design because what it is, is it, it's a solid building, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a gazebo because it's built on these large piers, which themselves are reduced by having openings on the back. So you've got large niches on the interior, small niches on the exterior, which um, reduce the amount of weight that you have because there's there's space in the center. So what you end up with is a series of rectangular, or sorry, of irregular piers throughout the building with niches in between. Again, that signature um, alternation of rectangular and semicircular shapes. How this all stays up is something of a mystery, but one of the features that makes this possible is that incorporated in the structure are a series of relieving arches. So each one of those piers is here. The windows pierce the areas um, behind those apses. And here's the pier, which takes the, um, the weight of the building so that you have these relieving arches, which are designed to channel the weight onto these great piers in between, eight of them all the way around. And so essentially it's eight large irregular piers with just a curtain wall in between. Um, sorry, curtain wall in between. There's the apse. You can see how narrow that wall is. Um, and a great oculus across the top, which is itself about 30 feet across. It's incredibly sophisticated. It's made possible again because of concrete. All the brick that you see here is a facing. It's just a brick facing. Um, and the, um, the concrete is the material that makes up the walls and the dome. Everything is poured concrete. Why do I think this is a, a material that changed the world? Because it's still with us today. If we look at Hadrian's Pantheon, we see the form of the Pantheon is still with us in the Jefferson Memorial, in the Rotunda at the University of Virginia. That form made possible because of um, the use of concrete is still with us, but the material is with us as well in forms that the Romans would recognize, retaining walls, for example, simple forms of, of poured retaining walls, and forms that they wouldn't recognize, like in this um, uh, magnificent assembly building in India, um, made possible again because of poured concrete. So the idea, I think, that concrete is a material explored by the Romans, taken to a certain step, really um, is a material that has continued to change architecture in the world. And I wanted to leave you once again with our um, our call to become a friend of the humanities. If possible, please consider joining the Humanities Center, learn about their programs, and um, become a friend of the Humanities Center. At um, And there you can see the address down below. And that's all I have. I'd be really happy to take, um, take questions if we could do that. And let me um, see if I can get off of... Um, 
of that and um, you get back to, um, to seeing people. Well, hello again, Steve. I have to hand it to you. That was fantastic. I have well, thanks. To say you surpassed even my wildest expectations for how interesting concrete could be made. <laughs> but that's that low, right? I mean, low expectations for concrete. Well, it's concrete. Yeah. You kind of it's think concrete. how interesting can concrete be? But in fact, you made that riveting. Um, and that's that awesome. is evidenced by the number of questions that mm, came in. Just started. Presentation. So let's see. I'm going to start with a couple that just came in. Um, and this is one that I was going to ask myself if no one else did. Um, let's see. Any sense of how much labor um, was used to construct these buildings? And you mentioned pouring concrete into forms. Do you have any idea how big the buckets or vessels or, or whatever may have been used for that concrete? Um, and was there any mechanical advantage? Actually, there is no mechanical, um, almost no mechanical work here. And here's the thing, is the Roman, any Roman infrastructure project or building project is a jobs program. And so we have this marvelous account of a Roman emperor who a guy comes to him with this labor saving device like a pulley system for lifting large blocks. And the emperor pays the man for it, but says, I can't use it. Um, because, you know, my work, my, um, my infrastructure projects are, are works programs and I can't put people out of work. And so um, uh, Janet Delane at the University of Reading, now at Oxford University, has done some really sophisticated work on the number of people involved in these projects. So something like um, the palace of the emperor um, Nero, the golden house, a large concrete complex would probably take about five thousand workers at a time excavating pouring concrete doing all of the steps along the way so it's a huge workforce here um, involved and um, the pouring is the really interesting part because once you build the wooden forms normally we pour concrete in batches um, three or nine yard trucks you pull up a concrete truck you know it holds nine cubic yards of concrete you pour that in, you go get another one. But those batches never fully mix. There, You always get batch marks. The dome of the Pantheon has no batch marks. Um, it seems to have been poured in one batch. Um, other Roman, I, I've seen other Roman concrete walls with batch marks where they dumped in the equivalent of nine yards, and then they went back and got another one because the aggregate differs slightly, the mix is different. There's always some difference. You can always tell. Uh, uh, there's always a line. The Pantheon has no lines. They seem to have poured that entire dome simultaneously. That's fascinating. It I know. It just blows my mind. It really does. It yeah. really does. That is a feat, you know, that just, I guess, cannot ever be understood. Thousands, wow. thousands of workers all coordinated, you know, um, on site. Around the clock. Yeah. Wow. We do know, um, actually, the Pantheon is in Rome. And if you go about a mile north of the Pantheon, there's an ancient Roman pavement, um, which is still there. And it has the remains of the pavement. They chiseled in the outlines of parts of the Pantheon. Um, and so you can still see where they, where they roughed out parts of the building. It's a mile away. So the construction site must have been vast. Um, you know, it must have taken up miles of, of space to build this thing. Um, just bringing in the materials and, and those thousands of workers, uh, just the scale is just uh, amazing. That is fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Moving on to our next question. Um, let's see. I, this is a good question. Did the chemistry of the concrete change up to the Pantheon construction? That is, you know, what was their mix of cement and gravel has that evolved did that evolve in in that time period oh that that's a great question um yes actually so the architect vitruvius who i mentioned gives us the name for that pozzolana volcanic sand he gives three different formulae for concrete in his handbook on architecture and it depends on what you're using the concrete for if you need hydraulic concrete that's going to set up underwater, you got to use pozzolana. 
And so he gives three different formula with different proportions of lime to sand to aggregate to the stone pumice or whatever you use as the as the stone inside. Um, so the Romans were constantly experimenting with um, with their um, with their formulae for concrete, and uh, and it changes over time. And it's really interesting to see if you're interested in concrete formulae. Um, and um, like me, don't have a life. And uh, it's interesting to see that that actually does change. It changes based on use. It changes based on time. It changes based on um, what they're doing with it. For example, the aggregate is the little the stone you use. So you got sand, you got lime, and then you've got stone, and you mix those together with water, and that makes concrete. At the Pantheon, the aggregate, the stone that you've got in there, changes as you go up the wall. So on the lower levels, it's a heavier, denser material like limestone or something. Um, as you go up, then that switches to a lighter material, broken pieces of brick. And then by the time you get up the dome, the aggregate is all pumice. Um, it's all light volcanic stone, very, you know, porous. Um, so that the dome itself doesn't add any more weight than necessary onto that wall. And so they've changed the aggregate all the way up that building to take into account, um, you know, the weight of the concrete. Um, it's really, it's, it's just incredibly um, sophisticated. Um, it, it's sophisticated is the word of the day, um, as far as I'm I concerned. Like yeah. Wow. <laughs> For sure. Um, okay, so here's another question for you. How did the Romans first discover the process of creating concrete? And how long after that discovery did they start actually, you know, having the thought bubbles, we could, we could use this to build? That is a very, um, a very contentious debate among architectural historians. Um, I wrote an article um early in my career, um, down dating one of the most important Roman concrete buildings, which I did not show you because I can't show you everything, uh, down dating it 100 years. What I think is the Romans always knew about mortar, just mortar like you put between bricks, mortar. But actual concrete, um, they did not begin to experiment with until after um, they created the colony at Puteoli. So when they had direct contact with the materials down there, the first concrete buildings we know of are not until um, almost a hundred years later, though. And so it's sometime in the second century BC when the Romans engage with this material, experiment with it, and then decide to try and use it to copy what the Greeks had done in their architecture. But it's only after um, about the year 100. Um, when we have um, individuals in the Roman world who can finance massive building programs that they start to apply concrete on a large scale. Um, and so it's um, the biggest obvious early concrete construction is about 100 BC. There's some smaller ones before then um, in the area of the Bay of Naples, but it's about 100 BC. So it takes them almost 90 years after they found that colony to um, to um, experiment with this material. Wow. Okay, so that sort of leads me to my next couple questions. And, and there are a couple questions that are real similar um, about, um, was there any use of metal reinforcement in casting concrete? When was rebar officially introduced? You know, because mm -hmm. concrete is heavy. And, you know, is, um, you know, sometimes it needs a little reinforcement. Can you expand upon that a little? Oh, yeah. Sometimes it needs a lot of reinforcement. You need a lot of concrete um, rebar. Um, the Romans did not use rebar. Um, well, uh, sorry, I should say, I, if I say definitively they didn't use it, then, you know, they're going to find some tomorrow and I'm going to look like an idiot. Um, the only evidence for the Romans using metal rebar-like material is much later in the third century AD, okay? And they used it in one large dome in a bath complex. And it was so revolutionary that in fact, um, 
uh, they, they talk about it in um, in the emperor's biography. So this third century emperor built a bath complex and they used a, a wire mesh or a metal mesh, essentially rebar, um, inside this dome, inside the concrete. And, um, well, boy, that was a revolution. So the third century AD is the earliest example that I know of. Now, before that, they tried other things to lighten um, the weight of um, the concrete domes and hopefully to create um, a sort of a self-supporting structure. And one of the things they used were clay pots, large clay pots that they would push up into the concrete to try and create voids um, so, that, um, so that hopefully you wouldn't need as much material and it would be lighter. And we see these in the second and third centuries AD as well. So clearly by the, the, by the second and third century, they're experimenting with other things. Well, but the first metal rebar is third century AD. I see. Okay. All right. Um, so this is a question um, from another humanities presenter. He says, you presented a lot of cases when concrete was faced with stone or with brick. Um, was there no aesthetic value to the smooth surface of concrete or that concrete could evoke? Or was it simply, you know, structurally unsound and not to you know, face concrete. Oh, um, the facing uh, the facing serves no structural purpose. Um, it is purely a decorative facing, and it seems to have been an aesthetic decision. Um, the Romans did not admire um, bare concrete; they admired stone construction. And so, in the initial phases, what we see is that irregular stone, which we see the Romans wouldn't even have seen that because in most cases, that would be heavily plastered. And that plaster very often was then cut with like the edge of your trowel, take the point of your trowel and cut a line, and it was cut to look like ashlar's blocks. Remember, they were initially copying Greek architecture, but with the materials they, they had confidence in. So they're using concrete, basing it with that irregular stone, and then plastering it and then cutting that plaster to look like the ashlar stone that the Greeks were using. Um, and in some cases, cutting that st stone and then painting it to look like uh, marble, like putting veins in it and all, faux painting it. Um, yeah, it seems very odd. But no, there is no, nobody seems to have appreciated just a nice concrete wall. There's no, um, like that example I showed you from India, um, of, you know, Le Corbusier or, um, or I am pay. Um, I've seen some um, um, preformed concrete construction that he has, has used and just left bare. Oh, Romans would never do that. Well, I call that character. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And maybe we have time for one last question. Okay or two. Um, okay, this comes from Melissa, and I think she's envisioning a, a, a Rick Steves Tuck scenario here. Um, will you be leading any tours of Roman buildings for Miami alums or parents anytime in the future? Which is an excellent question. I would join. I keep waiting for the Alumni Association to call me. Um, I, um, I lead tours all the time for high school teachers, for uh, interested non-professionals for other institutions. I'd be I'd be happy to to do that for for alums. I um, I I, I very much enjoy it, and I think it would be a blast. It would be a great time. Um, you know, I uh, I know where all the good buildings are. I know where all the good coffee shops in Rome are. Um, I know where the um the local wine shops are. So really, we've got um we've got the full day plan. So I um, I think we can um we could really make something good out of that. So. Well, Steve, your offer is duly noted. I okay. will pass that on because it sounds like there is some great interest in that. Oh, uh, it'd be fun. What a great talk today. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuck. Thank um, you. We have had a great session with you today, but that's all the time we have. As a reminder to our audience, a recording of this presentation will be available later today on our website. Thank you again to Dr. Tuck for leading our webinar today. To learn more about the important work of the Humanities Center at Miami and other lectures in this series, 
please go to humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. To donate and become a friend of the humanities, please go to give to miamioh.org slash humanitycenter. And please check out our new and other archived webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash miamioh. Thank you all for joining us today and love and honor.